and parking his car. Okay. Um, however, we do have a quorum, and so I am going to call this meeting to order at 10 o'clock. I have a question. Do we have our translator with the... Okay. Do we do we have our our translation deals or okay good deal. I'm w I'm waiting because I I want to make sure that the translation um, the audio translation uh, is available. To anyone who wishes it. Larry. <laughs> I'm not trying. Uh, and I can't compete. I can't compete. I'm in this one. I'm kind of just in here, kind of swimming in the private suite. I love how you guys are just leaving me up here all by myself. <laughs> Hey, 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 <laughs> what I said was we should put it should say Morrison Arps. <laughs> you just, you just left off the Morrison. Uh, okay, we are we are underway. Um, are we all fixed up with the translation machines? Everybody ready? Not quite. Okay. Okay, I'm going to assume that if anyone needs to wait for the translation machines or anything, let me know, please. I want to make sure that you have the ability to hear everything you need. Okay, good deal. Do you mind speaking a little louder, please, so I can hear you? I would be happy to. Thank you so much. Having been in theater arts, I can project to the back of an auditorium. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, I want to take a look at the agenda and have you take a look at that and um, approve it. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Okay. Um, all those in favor of approving the agenda as written, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Um, take a look at the minutes, please. Same that previously been sent to us. As a draft. Motion to approve. Okay, any discussion or questions? <laughs> okay, all those in favor of approving the minutes as written, please say aye. 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 Okay, no opposing. All right, so um, we'll now have public comment. We have um, a number of public comments, and um, I didn't get them in any particular order. So I'm going to go ahead and ask um, Hilda. Are you having a? Oh, yeah, I see right here. Okay. Good 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Isa Rodriguez Guzman, founding parent of PASS since 1994 and grandparent, health services coordinator since 2007, SCIU Local 99, chief steward of the classified staff since 2010. As a law school vice council chair. When I began my employment in 2007, I quickly discovered that my services were greatly needed. I understood why Kevin Seved, co founder of the Accelerated School, desperately sought me out. There were students that, being, that weren't being properly medicated for doctor's orders. Immunization compliance was a huge concern, coupled with a lack of health policies and procedures. I quickly jumped into my role as TAS with ease. Given my background as an Esperanza Community Health Promotora, LAUSD Healthcare Advocate, and USC Head Start Health Service Coordinator, those roles enabled me to provide and perform the duties and responsibilities to the students that I have and directly provide them health services, which, which are in dire need. I developed many policies and procedures throughout my tenure at TAS which weren't solely health related. I have, been, I have had an excellent track record for close to 12 years of service at TAS. I have dedicated my personal and professional career to ensuring that TAS keeps our mission and vision alive for years to come. I wasn't shocked, but definitely disappointed with the manner in which my long-standing employment with TAS was terminated abruptly without notice and no negotiations or discussions with my union representative via email on July 11, 2019. I am here today surrounded by my children and my community to ask the court to reinstate me in my position as health service coordinator effective immediately, as I have done nothing wrong but care and advocate for my community. I do not deserve, deserve this unjust treatment by this board and school officials. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, oh, Francis Redding. Well, I just came to comment because um, I know from the last board meeting that we uh, moved our organizational goal, our first organizational goal, to accelerate learning. And um, I'm coming to thank the board, first of all, for that priority. And I also want to come to speak on the huge, massive organizational shift that has occurred this year. Um, our team has already had 80 informal observations, multiple workshops, and I would say this is probably one of the first years where I'd say that instruction is truly our focus. Uh, with the addition of the directors, the directors have taken on a lot of duties that the principals and the, uh, the assistant principals would often do. And so our focus is in the classroom, preparing workshops and supporting teachers uh, so that we can move that to our priority at the school and accelerate learning. So I wanna thank the board and I wanna thank the support team today for making that focus. Um, I want to thank the directors for being good coaches and for being in our walkthroughs, being in our administrative meetings and giving us feedback and helping us improve so that we can get better, uh, so that we can have better results in the future. Thank you so much, Mr. Redding. Appreciate that. Um, by the way, are we recording this? Okay, I just wanted to make sure that everybody, I, I apologize, I have forgotten to mention this. We are recording our board meetings at this point so that when January comes and we're required to do that and post the recordings on our website, we will have had an opportunity to work out the bugs and figure out how to make that really uh, positive for all of us. So it is being recorded. Just audio or audio video? Audio at this point. Thank you. Okay. Um, Justin Guzman. Good morning. My name is Justin Guzman. I am the youngest child and former student at the Accelerated Schools. This Board of Education is well, well aware of my struggle that has in healthcare since my mother has advocated for me and for other students with disabilities. My mother has given me the courage and strength to stand here today and speak. She taught me that my struggles don't define me and make me stronger and resilient. 
She has taught me to never give up and speak my truth without conviction. As you well aware, high school is built on the bonds you make. However, in Taz's case, it's been extremely difficult. Due to the constant teacher and staff yearly turnover, how is this institution supposed to promote a welcome and safe environment when the students are constantly greeted by strangers each and every year? My mother is one of the last remaining pillars of unity within Taz. As she has developed a deep connection with this community, she has helped countless of people, which includes students, staff, and parents alike. Sadly, I knew this day would come, but the determination is the determination I no longer see that unity Taz once had. What I see now is fear mongering because you all are afraid that she's providing a voice for the voiceless. What she has done is demanded that Taz keep his promise to provide a quality education and serve the students equally. This board, in turn, chose to unjustly terminate my mother's position, which she loves so dearly. In close, I join my mother, siblings, and community to ask this board to reconsider its decision and give my mom her job back that she's had for 11 plus years. Thank you. Um, Christina Guzman. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christina Guzman. I attended the accelerated school since its inception. I actually recognize some things. Kindergarten through 12th grade. And where I was the first first graduating class as well as I never high school in 2007. Um, I am the mother of a second grade student attending ages, and I am Tilda's eldest child. I join my mother and my siblings here today to state that I am heartbroken and dismayed by the board's decision to wrongfully terminate my mother's employment from tax, as they have done so to many of the teachers that I had throughout the years. She is compassionate, dedicated, hardworking, and a strong supporter of equality in public schools, um, and that they all that they serve all especially this neighborhood in which we've lived our entire lives. She's always looking out for the best interests of others. She has instilled in all of us the importance of advocating for ourselves and has been an exceptional role model for me as a mother. This ordeal has been difficult for our family given that my mother has given so much and our lengthy history with Pat and this community. Words cannot express my disappointment to the board and it's unethical treatment of my mother simply because she has advocated for my siblings and my child. I ask this board to consider the decision to reinstate my mother in her position that she held since 2007, um, soon after I graduated from school. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, Sylvia Venegas. Good morning once again, Sylvia Venegas. I'm a member of ACE and I am the president of our education chapter where Sylvia is holds the vice presidency. She's brought in so much um, knowledge and information and support to our community as well, not just to your accelerated program. She's a pillar of our community, especially in our special education. And what this board has done unjustly is firing her by, by mail, just proves to show how um, on opposite sides you guys are. You guys really need to know that she is a very important asset into this um, school as she has mentioned before. And you guys um, really need to reconsider that because she brings a lot more than just special education and community values into um, not just this space, in a broader area as well. So you guys really need to reconsider what you guys to do. Ms. Venegas, could you help us understand what ACE is? What uh, ACE for California Community Empowerment. Okay, and are there different chapters throughout California? We do. We focus on um, tenants, homeowners, and education. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It's the first time I believe I've I've been aware of ACE. I you appreciate can your. Up on Facebook and join our, our page. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Venegas. Okay, and finally we have. Um, is it Beverly Roberts or Roberts Beverly? Yes, Beverly Roberts. Beverly Roberts. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. As I said, my name is Beverly Roberts. I'm the chair for the Home Defense League. I've been with 
place for nine years, and we worked for the community. But I'm here to support children. And from what I've heard, I don't understand what all of this. I've only gotten bits and pieces. But I'm here to support her because she works hard in the argument, and we support her. So whatever it is you need to do, you need to do it. But also, I want to ask you this. Is this all the board members? Or this is you? Um, all but two. Okay, One. Why is there no more diversity? Oh, two? Oh, why is there no more diversity in our community? Why is that? Can you answer me that? This is public comments. We don't need to well, respond at this public, point. I'm in the public and you in our community. So you need to answer me that. Why isn't there no more diversity since you're in our community? Why? I, I, when I walked in here, I said, mm -hmm. no wonder they fired the girl. You better think about it because you're going to pay for it. I'm really pissed because this don't make me quit. Okay, um, Victoria Enriquez. I'll translate for her. Okay, with translation, with translation, you get you get twice as much time. Buenos días, mi nombre es Victoria Enrique. Yo vengo a apoyar a la señora Isla. Mi nombre es Victoria Enrique. She's here to support the Hilda Rodriguez. Que no es posible que le hayan quitado su trabajo. It's not possible for you guys to have taken her employment away. No sé lo que ella siente, porque yo cuando trabajé en una compañía también hicieron lo mismo. She understands the feeling because she was in the work in the company. She received the favor de regresar de su trabajo y la persona que está trabajando que se quede también no no la saquen de su trabajo que se queden las dos personas por favor she's asking for her to for you guys to give her back her employment but only about her not to let go of the other person who's also assisting her porque no es posible que tiene muchos años trabajando acá y de repente le quite su trabajo it's not possible for her to have been here such a long time and for you guys to take her job away es lo que me estamos pidiendo a ustedes que le regresen su trabajo, por favor. We're asking you to give her back her employment. Porque ella, yo sé lo que se siente cuando uno la, la despide de su trabajo. Se siente uno muy mal. She understands how she feels being without an employment after it's been taken away. She feels bad. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Um, Angela Jimenez. Good morning, my name is Angelina Jimenez, member of eight. I'm here to support teacher Hilda. I don't believe that if she was a bad teacher, you guys would have fired her a long time ago, not me. She knows she's here because she knows not just the children, but you guys also need her here because you guys need confident people. Nosotros siempre hemos estado a favor de la niñez, de que los niños tengan los mejores maestros, que tengan los mejores útiles, todo lo que necesitan y también mentalmente. She values children and their education and also knows that she, we need the support for them, and which is something that she's been providing. Entonces, por favor, les pido que dejen a la maestra en su puesto y también a la enfermera que tienen hoy. You need to put her back in her uh, position and also the nurse that you guys have. Muchas gracias. Y ojalá lo piensen de verdad. Thank you and think about it truthfully. Um, Anita. Nishlan. Good 
Good morning. For your record, my name is Anita Nicklen, N-I-C-K-L-E-N. And I'm a registered voter uh, who has always supported all the initiatives to bring more money to schools. I'm a taxpayer payer, and also uh, I own a home. I'm here in support of Hilda Rodriguez. I think that she has shown that she's a very qualified employee with a lot of experience, and that's what the children need in our community. She cares about um, she cares about the children a lot, and she has uh, she's an asset in our community. Uh, she has been working um, with us in many issues. It's wrong that she was terminated. Please give her the job back. And a second petition here. Please respond to one of the uh, A ACA leaders or ACCE leaders um, with the question that she raised about diversity in this, you know, school board. Thank you so much. Uh, Maria Sanchez. Buenos días. Good morning. Mi nombre es Maria Sanchez. Soy madre de dos niños que participan en las escuelas aceleradas. Vivo en esta comunidad hace más de 16 años y vivo activamente por más de 16 años. Okay, good morning, my name is uh, Maria Sanchez. I'm a mother of two children who are also in accelerated schools. And I work in this community, in the school, and she's very active for more than 16 years. Yo siempre he pensado que la escuela es como un reloj y que cada engrane y cada rondana es importante para sus dos niños. She's always um, thought of the school as a watch. And every part, every Screw has a fundamental and valuable piece of uh, function. She wants to refer to Matilda Rodriguez as to why her children have been in the school, the accelerated program. Hilda has uh, brought on to her a lot of education and empowerment on how to speak up and how to advocate for her children. She's very grateful for her also in impacting her in her own life. Creo que Hilda debe de regresar a la escuela y hacer un buen equipo con las enfermeras que ahora tienen. She wants Hilda to come back to her job and work hand in hand with the nurse that they have and make a great team. Pienso que para la otra enfermera tres escuelas para ella sola no es suficiente. It's unjust for the other nurse to have three schools just for one person. Pienso que la señora Hilda conoce a nuestros hijos más que todos ustedes juntos y que la nueva enfermera. Hilda knows all the children in the school more than you guys will or the nurse or have and the nurse either. She has seen them grow not just in the school but also in our community. She feels she's in a room of wise people like yourself. Y sé que van a tomar la mejor decisión, pero yo los repito y los repito. Nosotros también somos parte de esta escuela porque somos los padres. Pero I'm going to repeat over and over that we are the parents of this school and you guys have to listen to us as well. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, Marilyn Cabrera. Hello, good morning. My name is Marissa Brown. I was a former student here at the Accelerated School, graduated class of 2017. has not only been a pillar in our community within our school, but in our community outside of school. 
She has not only brought light many issues that have been ongoing and have not been dealt with, but she has taught parents more about, well, which I feel is a lack of carelessness within our school system, a school that prided itself as one of the best schools in South Central It was a school that you heard the wrong parents. I want my child to go to that school. I want my child to receive the best education possible. Well, that has not only Could we have you turn off your phones, please? I mean, you can film all you want, but if you have a ringer, if you would turn the ringer down, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, hon. Well, there have not many parents to raise their voices as to when they felt they could not because of their lack of knowledge, not only as to where they were, but what was going on. I believe that Hilda should be reinstated in Cat because she has been very creative as her coming out on her own, helping educate people, bringing the youth together. As you hear the parents here, they, we feel very strongly for Hilda because it not only comes from a place that we know as a person, but as a person who wants better for everyone, for kids, for teachers. And as you have seen, she has shown that. Being an activist within our community, advocating <clears throat> for everyone. <laughs> Thank you. And our last um, person, um, is it Georges Roman? Five years, three children have gone through tasks. All the countless volunteer hours, trying to improve the school. And it's your fault. That's what your HR director has said. This came from all of you. So it's all of your responsibility to fix this. While on medical leave, via email, the cruelest way to treat people has been pillars of tasks. No tienen madre. No tienen madre. Shame on all of you. Shame on 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 Shame on you. 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 Where are all the parents? Why don't we have more parents listening to what's happening? 
Why don't they have the opportunity to be here? You've, you've had the opportunity yes, to speak no, for your two minutes. We appreciate it. And we're going to move the Thank agenda you. along. Madam President, we are ready for the Chief Executive Officer's report on the agenda, and we're going to be introducing a couple of new staff members, members of the board. Our first introduction is Mr. Robert Kanosakar. He likes to be called Bobby, and he is rounding out our team as our secondary director of education. He started his educational career as a high school English teacher for LAUSD, and after numerous years, Mr. Kanosakar was promoted to LAUSD Central Office as English language arts content specialist. He then served as assistant principal of two high schools with multiple tracks, and Mr. Carr is a seasoned high school principal. We'll be Plus, back! We'll, we'll be back! back. And we'll be back! The whole we'll be back! 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 transitioning to um, a comprehensive high school into a set of three science-themed magnet schools. Then he became the founding principal of Baxter High School at, from Alliance College Ready Public Schools, where he headed the implementation of blended and personalized learning instructional model. He graduated with Bachelors of Arts in English, and he also served as CIS president for Los Angeles section. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Kanosa Carr as our director of secondary education. Sorry, your introduction was interrupted, but welcome Bobby, aboard. Bobby, would you like to say a couple of words to our board? Just thank you very much for bringing me on board. It's an honor to be able to work with this organization. It's been my passion throughout my career to provide opportunities for traditionally underserved children to get a world-class education. That was why I chose to join this organization, because I believe that vision that I have for myself and my career is very much in alignment with the leadership we have in this organization. So I thank you for the opportunity to work with you to do that. Welcome. Um, we also have our two college and career ready counselors. Those are new positions supporting our high school. Uh, is Dr. Huang, would you mind doing the introduction for your two college and career ready counselors? Sure. Um, this is Daisy Flores and this is Jacob Palm. So there are two counselors and um, this year, so the way that we split it up is Mr. Palm has ninth and 11th grade students and then Ms. Daisy Flores has the 10th and the 12th grade students working alongside Ms. Zelaya in terms of providing support for all the teachers. Welcome aboard. Thank you, and then our last introduction will be with our director of HR who would like to introduce our new nurse. Yes, so we have a, a, a new district RN. She started August 1st. Um, she's not present here this morning, um, but uh, Sylvia Castro, and she has over 20 years of medical experience. She actually started as a medical assistant at Kaiser over 20 years ago, so we're really excited to have her on board. She will be serving, she'll be housed out of SAS, and she'll be serving all three schools during the week. We're excited to have her. Okay, wish she were here to welcome her, but I'm sure as nurse she's very busy. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to move into the president's report, and um, I'm, how many of you had the opportunity to listen to the audio? I did not of, of our last meeting. Okay, well, I guess it's pretty instructive, you know, because it captures everything we say, so. <laughs> All right, so um, we, what we did uh, at the last board meeting was have the board identify two priorities for board goals to help direct the focus for this particular year in the actual operations. So, uh, Grace, I'd like to turn this over to you. Actually, Julie, it's yep. under 11 o'clock um, under board goal discussion. Oh, I see, okay. 
Well, we're going to review those at 11. Okay. Um, parent representative nomination process. In your board packet, under the president's report, uh, the first item is the parent board represent, representative nomination and election process. One of the things that we realized was that we needed to have a consistent and coherent election process, nomination and election process for parents to serve on the board across all three schools. In the past, the schools have been doing things a little bit differently and we wanted to codify this. And because the parents would be joining the board, we wanted to have the board nomination committee um, responsible for part of this process. So you'll see, if you have the opportunity to read this, um, you'll see that our purpose was to really make sure that our parents were represented on the board, that the parents will be able to contribute to the overall vision and mission of the accelerated school, and that they are nominated, elected, and approved by their school's population and the full board consistent with task governing, um, governing board bylaws. We formed a group and we asked the principals to develop a nomination form with these particular uh, qualifications, which you'll find on the next page, um, and encourage and recruit parents from across their school to apply to be on the board as a parent representative. Those applications are coming in now. They will be um, collected fairly soon. We're hoping that the board nomination committee, which is Leonard, myself, and Binti, we do have some diversity on the board. Unfortunately, they're just not here. Um, and we will take a look at what the nomination um, applications look like, which in will include a resume, a statement of intent, and how they feel they can really help the accelerated schools uh, by being on the board. And then we will, the nomination committee will review those and get back to the principals about people we feel the parents we feel are eligible to serve. And um, that is part of this. So the nomination committee, step four, will review those. And then at, the, at a subsequent governing board meeting, our next would be in September. That is going to be a call-in. So one of the assumptions we're making is that if the board nomination committee approves these parents to stand for nomination at their individual schools, and they are elected by their school population at a formally held meeting, which is part of the bylaws, that then we would assume that the rest of the board would feel comfortable doing it on a consent item. Okay, so I just, the dates will change. One of the things we're interested in doing is having these elections be at the end of the school year so that we can engage parents early in the summer with onboarding and helping to train them so that they become more verbal and um, able to assist us on the board. So eventually we're hoping to change that timeline. Again, the timeline then would have our parent representatives starting at the beginning of the school year rather than in the middle of the school year in December where we've had all of these things going on and then they come on board and they really don't have as much context as they need in order to be viable board members and um, be with us. So one of the things we're looking at is just changing that particular timeline. So whole board votes, that would be by consent, we're hoping in September, um, and the new parent board representatives will be welcomed onto the board and they will um, have an onboarding. And um, that is this particular action item and I would open this up for discussion. So for this first year, uh -huh. what's the timeline again please? The timeline, the elections are set to be um, mid-September. So that means by this each of the individual schools, schools after our right. committee has taken a look at the, mm -hmm. at the paperwork. Yes. 
And so the timeline would be then, September they would be approved, and then I would do an onboarding with them in early October so that they can be seated in October and then spend the rest of the year with us. We've encouraged the parents who have applied before to apply again with this new nomination process. And parents have previously applied, what was the number? Um, we don't have all of the applications in right now. Approximately, do, do we have? Um, I believe TAF has two, with okay. two more coming. Um, I'm not sure about ACEs and WAS. Have we, have we had any um, people volunteer to be on the board yet? Maybe four or five from the high school? Oh, from ACES, sorry. Okay. Okay, good deal. May I ask a question? Go, go ahead. The, uh, the nurse that we hired, her level is, is she, did I hear you say she was an RN? She's an RN, yes. Great. Okay. Verified by um, uh, on the website. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, any other questions or discussion on this new nomination process? I get a motion. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion or questions? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that was everybody. Okay, so that passes. Thank you very much. Next, school as a whole. This is an information item. One of the things that the accelerated school um, had as part of its principal organizing feature when Hank Levin developed the model was that if it were one school and you had different grade levels and different departments, each of those different grade levels and departments would have their own special issues but that to bring everyone together for a school as a whole, because there are going to be some issues that are overarching. Well, this is a small district, and with this particular group of schools, we have overarching issues that go beyond individual school issues that affect the entire community. So one of the things we wanted to do was, and when I say we, we had a committee that was working on this, and it included Grace, excuse me, Mrs. Chang, our CEO. Okay. Okay. I didn't know if I was like, I, I don't want to get, you know, too comfortable here with first names. But anyway, um, so we had Grace. I was uh, leading those meetings, and then we had all of the principals and our director of curriculum and instruction. We also invited our parents who had run for election. Scott has served. We had two other parents from um, ACES, oh, I lied, um, I misspoke, excuse me, uh, from TAS and from WAS. And they were with us as well, giving us ideas about what parent volunteerism could be like, the role they would like to play as board members, and the idea of the school as a whole came up, and they wholeheartedly supported it, this particular um, group. So you can see here a description. It is to recognize the issues that go across all three of our schools that affect us as a district, if you will, and the representative roles of the parents would have really a lot of meaning because they would be responsible for supporting the um, planning for and the communication out to their individual school parent population to bring them to the school as a whole. One of the things that became really quite apparent was that the topics that we wanted to have came up during the LCAP. And so we would be responding directly to the parents and the issues that they, um, that they highly found important in terms of the LCAP and the survey that they took. So we're really interested in expanding parent engagement. We want to make certain that our teachers um, are connected to the parents in multiple ways, and so the school as a whole is a different um, mechanism. And there, we currently have, tentatively, four per year 
The first one is going to be in September, and it's going to be the day before our call-in board meeting. And one of the things that is on the agenda is for me to talk about what the board role is in supporting the accelerated schools, and in particular, the two board goals that we have this year, so that our parents really know and understand the work that we're engaged in and that we are aligned as a board with our leadership and with our administration and with our faculty. So that's really the meaning of the uh, SAW. And we would have, uh, right now, keeping my fingers crossed, we're going to be floating a position for the parent and community liaison. And that person would be a full-time position that would work to support parent workshops, as well as our parent board representatives when they prepare for the school advisory, um, excuse me, the school as a whole. So this is just information because this is a management decision, so it isn't a board requirement, but we wanted to make certain that the board knew, and I'm inviting all of the board to come with me um, on September 25th, and I believe the meeting is at 8.30 in the morning, just so you know. Okay, any questions or um, Discussion about the school as a whole. We're actually pretty excited about it, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Um, okay, and then the last thing we have is a parent advisory committee. Now, when we have parents on the board, we do like for them to be involved in the committee. Uh, so far, our committees have not really been as energized, although that's one of my goals, personal board goals, to get our committees energized. And one of the things that we thought would be very important is for our parent representatives who are duly elected, having gone through the screening of their school and our board uh, nomination committee, would come together as a formally recognized committee of the board, which would mean that they would be responsible for following the Brown Act. 72, with, they have to come up with an agenda. The agenda needs to go out and be publicized. Minutes need to be taken and then reported back at the following meeting. We're very interested in this being a formal committee of the board, first of all, because we didn't want this to be a group of parents who were just complaining. We wanted it to be a group of parents who were seeking to take issues that the parents bring, both in the individual schools, but also across all three schools, so that it was an organized meeting and it fed into the board as a whole. So, um, this is an action item. It doesn't say that on the pack, but this is an action item, and we would like um, some discussion and questions about this. Parent advisory committee members would also be board members, is that what you're saying? They would be board members, and therefore they would be on this committee. They would be appointed to that committee so, as board members. And you're thinking that the, the parent board members would be the logical choice? To start out the committee, we could have other, like for instance, I'm planning on being on that committee myself, because part of it was my idea. So I thought I would just, you know, stand in front and uh, lead rather than stand in back and push. But yeah, I believe other board members could certainly be a part of, of the uh, that particular committee. I like the formality of it because it puts some constraints, but it also gives the, it gives a huge opportunity for voicing a lot of these kinds of issues, but in a formal protocol sort of way. Right, and one of, the, uh, one of the attributes of this particular proposal is that there would be a time on each board agenda 
for the Parent Advisory Committee to report to the board and to the public about what the issues are. Any other And the, the community and parent liaison would be a part of those meetings, but not, obviously not a, a formal part of the board, but a part of the meetings and... Right, right. Because the parent community liaison, in, in our mind, in the committee's mind that worked on this to put it together, was that it goes beyond the parent advisory committee to parent workshops, um, reaching out to the community in other ways, planning uh, cleanup events, um, working with the school leadership, so that the school leadership wasn't planning individual things all along, but that this parent and community liaison was really responsible for outreach to the community, bringing the community in, and um, sharing issues with our board. Mm -hmm. But the parent um, community liaison would have a very active role in that. We took the model actually from um, the 21st Century Learning Center where Yvonne Chan is the principal and has been the principal for 25 years. I went out and spent the day with uh, their particular um, community member and came back with just incredible um, ideas about how to form partnerships with community groups as well as to have different kinds of workshops for parents and to bring the schools into that and the faculties into that. One of the things they had which was really fascinating was they had two monthly parent meetings with different topics that the parents had identified and each grade level throughout the year was responsible for one of these meetings and they provided um, child care, and they provided very minimum but interesting little um, cookies and coffee kind of thing. And so each grade level, now I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it was a, one of those ideas that really resonated with me that brought the faculty in to more connection with the parents and with meeting the kids. So I thought it was a good idea. Any any other questions or comments? Uh, just a comment, Julie. I just want to say thank you so much for all your effort that you put into this. I think it's super significant that um, that these things are happening, and just as a parent, really grateful for the effort you put into. Thanks, and I want to thank the committee. Um, as I mentioned, that was all of our principals, uh, director of curriculum instruction, and our CEO. So this was a large group that met four or five, well actually I think we met five times, to put this together and to really flesh this out. Okay, so can I get a motion? Okay. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. I'm a happy girl. Okay, you've, you've um, made my year because I'm so interested in really getting connected with our parent community in, in a very different way. And integrating. And integrating, point, yeah. Uh, we've got to kind of, can't just have it a block. And, yeah. You know, it's important. Right, and we will take all suggestions and love to have you all involved in whatever way you can and want to be. Okay, so update on collaborative consensus committee. Okay, this was another one. <laughs> of those interesting ideas that has blossomed and very, very excited. I can't even remember how many meetings we've had. How many have we had? We met About eight. eight. Is that counting the? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we met two days in a row in the afternoon after um, our, our teachers were um, out of summer school and the principals were with us. And we started out with our union representatives. And Carrie um, took another job, and she's not our union representative, so she was um, followed on that committee by, I can't remember who it was, but anyway, we had, we had teachers from each of the school, we had an administrator from each of the school, and um, Grace and I were there, and we did investigation 
from other districts and other charter schools, as well as from John's organization, on what their evaluations were like. And the purpose of the C3 committee, which is the, the collaborative consensus committee, came out of the negotiations. And there was a side letter signed that this, in fact, was going to be one of the committees that the school was going to support. And the first piece of business was to relook at and change the way teachers are evaluated. Because the second part of this was we wanted to develop multi-year criteria for contract, um, for offering multi-year contracts. And it was impossible for teachers to reach the that level of exceeds in everything um, as, across all of the different um, California standards for the teaching profession. Therefore, we have finished as a group a pilot that shifts the emphasis from catching you doing something wrong to catching you doing something right and really thinking about growth because anyone we hire, we want to keep, and we want them to grow. So we have a pilot that's starting this year within a, with the evaluation. We have, we have a vision from our CEO. We have how this relates to what used to be, as well as where we're headed and the direction we're headed, which is growth, support, and helping people become better educators. And um, we have the forms that were developed by the group. We have rubrics that are specific to those forms and what we're going to be observing. And one of the most exciting parts is that the teachers in this particular C3 committee have requested the opportunity to have a peer work with them and to give them feedback. So that is part of the pilot. So they will be, if, I, don't, I don't like the word evaluate, their performance will be assessed, let me just put it that way, um, by a number of people. It won't just be the administrator, it will be um, this peer that is selected and then it will also be potentially the coaches, the counselors, and other administrative managers. So there's a little bit larger group of people who are really going to be giving different perspectives. The other thing that we thought was really interesting, and we'll see how this works out because it is a pilot, but the first set of visits are going to focus on, <clears throat> and I wish I could remember the things that they were going to focus on. Uh, competencies related to classroom management instruction. <clears throat> right, beginning of the school year. Classroom management, you know that's a big, big deal, especially for some of our new teachers. And then the second group of visits will be teaching instruction and assessment. Okay, so that's when the getting ready for the, the testing goes, our own individual testing. And then the final set of, of uh, visits will be professional accountability and quality of student learning. Right. <laughs> okay, so. So this should be the four C's because <laughs> is, it a, is it an outgrowth of our cheesecake factory? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, actually it is. I mean, you were in the room when this topic so, came up. Yeah, yeah, I was actually going to say, I don't want to wait three years. Uh, no, no, it's starting. meeting with them, and suggest we meet again at the, at the Cheesecake Factory. And <laughs> what's going on? But, it's, but I don't think we need to do that. Those people, you think that they're satisfied that we are actually following through some of the proactive things. That uh, not that we're just following through with some of them. They are actively involved in helping create the new evaluation. It's co-created. So those Cheesecake Factory teachers, right? Are, are we confident that they're happy? With the yes, we are. Um, as a matter of fact, um, Amber is still on the committee. Mm -hmm. We've had two other teachers fill in for people who have left the leadership position, union position. And they're very excited. I mean, believe me, this was a consensus committee. It wasn't voting. It was. Feel we'd be productive to take them to lunch again. We'd be happy to come and host. 
I accept on their behalf. <laughs> okay, I mean, it was just, it's really been quite exciting and very fulfilling, and Grace has led this group incredibly well. Uh, she's really made strides in helping us get materials, take a look, giving us prompts, having us do homework, and coming back and being ready to talk and ready to make decisions about this. So I really want to thank you very, very much and to all of our principals who've, um, who've been on this committee as so well. So the core group it would be six teachers on a hearing? No, well, if, if you want to bring back the two teachers, right. well, one of them has um, moved on. Yeah. Um, Carrie is still with us, but right. she is a different position. And so we have the two teachers that were on there, as well as Amber, so that's the third teacher, and then our, our principals and Grace and myself. And they, maybe their peers that they've picked? Yeah. We, well, we'll see. Let's talk about that. Let's okay, we'll talk about that. Campus and yes. Just but it'd be really, it would be really fun to, to do that, and uh, we're going to make that Can work. Can we get a report on um, what the retention was? Or is that going to happen today? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's right. happening. Okay. Still here. Yeah. Retention, but the, the so buyers are okay. Oh, okay. And then um, update on external partners. We had a very, very successful uh, year last year with Brent Klein, who um, worked with UFC and with uh, Tara Goober on My Voice Matters. And what happened during that particular partnership? Tara invited stars from LAFC to come in and be interviewed by students. And this was a history social science class. So it's not just about English literacy. It's about their voice matters and how they can write about things. So they interviewed uh, these stars and wrote about different things and then presented their essays to the other people, um, other students. During the summer, we had a very successful summer school program where Lenox Middle School students and our middle school students who had been involved in the program came together for summer school. And we had um, a consultant come down from Oregon that started the, um, the uh, journalistic literacy um, GIC program initially that now is called My Voice Matters. And she worked very diligently with these students and with the teachers to help them understand how to help kids write and get their voice out there. They were each given uh, composition books, and they wrote about all of the interviews that they did. And then we had a very successful parent and student meeting at LAFC in their, I don't know what you would call it, it's a... It's loud. Their uh, restaurant, I guess you would call it, yeah. Enter entertainment center, you know, where they have the pinball machines and everything. But it was really fabulous. We had all of our parents show up, all of the kids showed up, and Tara was there and handed out LAFC scarves, you know, and all of that. So we are continuing that. Brent is continuing to do that in the middle school. And I've encouraged um, Francis to explore other teachers, maybe popping in when that My Voice Matters is going on to see if it might, you know, charge, charge them up a little bit. The other uh, partnerships are just beginning, and Elizabeth and I are working on this. Uh, USC, which has always had a family of five, which included the Fauché Learning Center and 32nd Street School, but never the accelerated school, is now reaching out to us. And they're reaching out to us on matters of STEM. They have in Dornsif, which is um, a group that they have there. There are experiential learning opportunities. There are STEM opportunities. There are other opportunities for students at USC to come and be a part of our classrooms. And so we, what we wanted to do with the direction from Grace was, we don't want this to look like a Christmas tree where we've got My Voice Matters here on this branch and we've got the STEM over here on this branch, but another STEM on this branch. We want it to be a coherent and consistent program where all partners, C 
see their role and see everyone else's role. One of the things that we're really looking forward to is having USC students on our campus. But we don't want them just coming willy-nilly and, oh, by the way, you're going to be in this teacher's classroom and this teacher's classroom. We want it to be really thought out. We want it to be formal. And we want it to be successful. So we have a meeting set up for September 27th with a number of our partners from Dornside. And we're going to start the conversation about what the um, available opportunities are and how they might work here at the Accelerated School. We're hoping to get Grace a bit of time so that she can come join us. All right, good deal. And um, that's really exciting where that goes. Now, in terms of other partnerships, our foundation has met. And we are looking at a parenting community center. And hopefully that space will be available. I don't want to, do, do we have that space available? Is that going to be available, library? In discussion. In discussion. OK. So we have an, we've identified an area we'd like for the parenting community um, committee and um, the liaison group to be housed. Once we do that, then I believe the foundation will be able to go to some of our potential funders and say, this is what we've got going. How can you help us? Okay? So I think that's it for my long-winded president's report. Okay? Okay. There we go. Any, any comments or anything else? Okay, good deal. Yes, yes, and they're they're really um, they're really reaching out to us. It's really cool. Well, I have, can I speak yeah, to go that just for a second. I'll, yeah. I'll elaborate on that. Um, you know, the precedent. I mean, I did go outside the family of five, and this was ten years. You ago. did I partnered with Susan. You Rogers, you rebel you. And <laughs> I did. I, I broke new ground and and came over here, and and my students have been coming here and making a real difference for years, probably about a decade. So this is why, one of the reasons why we can now accept this kind of, oh my gosh, we're going to now expand, you know, to do this. But it also gives us an opportunity to replicate, you know, to look up at, look at this model and say all we have to do is replicate it. It's already been sort of experimented with. Do you see what I mean? And we can examine it and tweak it, whatever we want to do with it. But, but really, the pattern is established. So instead of having to reinvent the wheel, we can just replicate it. Right. Good point. Yeah. Good point. OK, any, any other? OK, moving right along. It's um, you. Do the board members need a little stretch break, about five minutes? Yeah. Sure. You've okay. Been sitting for about an hour. So yeah. Am I? Come back at eleven fifteen. Thank you. Okay. How are you? Good. So, all right. Mm -hmm. Having a good summer? Yeah. Uh oh. Really strong. Yeah. Well, we didn't, we didn't really. I like to try to get away with this on if I can. Uh, we didn't really.
said before you move into the new code, right? But they walk with me, so you can't. It's really crazy. The concept's kind of staring towards so he moves to help out with the city. And it's really kind of diligent. Because the other three boys said, no, they don't want to leave. They'll say, yeah. I mean, thanks. Difficult, perhaps. But I don't know about that. 
Yep, I knew. I knew you did it, but I just wanted to say. <laughs> okay, see, I give people extra minutes and they take them. Yeah, walk away. Well, that's how it is. Oh. So when you go to Oh, Monday? Yep, 11 oh. days. It's a tour, but. but? But inexpensive. <laughs> what do you expect to see? Um, to Madrid. We're going to be in Madrid. Um, I, I don't. I haven't seen a map yet, so I don't really know exactly. Are you going to go to the, the Bill Bath or the museum? Oh, I'm. Yes, that's part of the itinerary. Yeah, I just know the cities we're going to at this point. I really haven't studied the itinerary very closely, but. It's Monday, you know. Yeah. Well, I figure on the plane. You get a little bit of time on the plane. Well, the dollar is very strong. Yeah. Yes, and that's why a lot of people are going. Yep. Yep. It was strong in Canada too. I was I was in Canada earlier in August. And it's exchanging? I know, you haven't even been to the um, now? Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was one Is there a different currency? One point thirteen. Oh my gosh. I thought it was higher than that. But that was yeah. but I ordered my my um Euros that's money a, a while ago. Oh your your Euros. Yeah. That was but still I was there a few years ago. It was a dollar seventy. Now it's oh yeah, dollar eleven. Well, and the pound has really gone down because mm -hmm. of the turmoil there. Oh yeah, well, now he's suspended Parliament. Now how about that? And the Queen said okay. There are peacekeepers from UCI that are going over to Ireland in, I think it's, I can't remember exactly when, because they, they don't want to see the troubles begin again. Okay, here we are, reconvened. We've got one member that we need. And we'll go ahead and start. Okay, here we go. All right, so um, presentations and reports. Our first report and presentation is actually more of a board member discussion. We wanted to bring back, this is a bring back from our last board meeting on accelerating, improving, and measuring student outcomes as our goal. Thank you very much for your lively discussion. I know you didn't have a chance to uh, listen to the board recording, so I listened to it on your behalf like four times. <laughs> <laughs> first time was to listen to Julie and be in awe of how she facilitated that discussion. It was one of the first times that we've come together as a board to have board goals. And then second time to listen and go through some of the comments that resonated with me. Elizabeth. Your, your point about going back to the accelerated, what is our mission and how can we do better at it? Leonard, uh, your comments about we've got the right people in the organization in place now, let's just do it. And then talking about what are our metrics, how do we measure this accelerating? Larry, thank you for recognizing the four common threads. Mission, where are we, where are we on mission? Quality personnel communications as a goal, and stability in personnel and finance. And thank you for recognizing that these aren't small changes. Um, Peter, um, going back to the mission of why. The why question drives our decision and the best educational product possible for our students. That's what we're for. Are our students successful using metrics that matter or other metrics? And then Binti, talking about life readiness for our graduates. Uh, we took all of this and we started designing what we think we should be measuring our organization for. And it starts off with our board goal to accelerate and improve and measure student outcomes. And we're going to be sharing with you four different ways that we think it should be measured along mile markers for our students that are within the organization. We're going to share a metric with you at the very early stage when they enter us at early literacy. We're going to talk about the mid-years growth and where are our students doing at growth. 
Then we're going to go to the achievement. Where is our final achievement for our students at the end using our high school data? And then lastly, how do we build the organizational system around talent recruitment and retention for these areas? We're going to be asking you four mini discussions. So after each of those four metrics, we're going to be asking you, are these the measures or is this the measure? We're going to be sharing with you, where are we now? And we would like to engage you in, this is where we are now and 100% is our end goal. Where do you see us going next? So the first success criteria that we would like to introduce is the early literacy measure of all students who are with us. When they enter our schools, and if they're entering our schools, that they should be reading at grade level by second grade. And Susan's going to elaborate more on why second grade reading Lexile level is an important indicator, and she's going to be sharing with us data on where we are right now. We'd like the board members to think about, and we're going to discuss afterwards, is this the right metric, and where should we go next? Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam President, board members. Good to see you. Um, I'm very excited about doing this because it's uh, measuring across all of the grade levels, and early literacy is a passion of mine. When I was in education, I was a literacy coach and a content expert. And so it's a huge part of what we want for our students to be able to accomplish. So um, as it says here, we want 100% of our students to have entered our school. They've entered in kindergarten. By second grade, we want them to be able um, to be reading at grade level. So why is early literacy important? It, it's just it's the basic foundation for students to be successful, for them to be able to graduate from high school, um, reduction in special education referrals. Um, kids that cannot read sometimes uh, are at risk for different behaviors and acting out in the classroom. Um, and it's also, it's more affordable because if you can address any type of reading difficulties that kids have early on, um, it's going to take less time to address it. So the question is, okay, how are we doing this? We want them to be successful in life. So let's look at uh, some of our early literacy data. We are still working on having a system and a process of gathering data that is common across um, both of the school sites. This is what we have currently. So if we look at uh, ACES and TAS for 2018, um, we have been working with uh, Learning Ovation, or A2I, which, uh, which is assessment to instruction. Um, it's an assessment that last year we began with kindergarten and first grade at both both TAS and ACES to measure growth for children. And it's looking um, not only on their ability to decode um, reading or the words, but it's also looking at uh, meaning and their vocabulary. And we know because of the community that we work in, many of our students come in and they are months below. So this assessment actually, vocabulary-wise, will measure, uh, for example, if a child is entering kindergarten, it will say that they are, their vocabulary is maybe um, that of a three-and-a-half-year-old in English, for example. So teachers are having to work very hard, administrators are having to work very hard in order to provide those type of enriching experiences for the kids to build up that vocabulary. Um, so this is the data from last year. I did check in with them because I was saying, well, I'm looking that maybe some of it goes down a little bit. Um, this is a long-term process. It's all the way from kindergarten to third grade. So it's not like, oh, by the end of kinder, we're going to have 100% of our kids. It's a process that the kids have to go kinder through third grade with the A2I. Um, the assessment to instruction also comes with a coach that comes to the school sites to work with the teachers. It's based around differentiated uh, small group instruction, student-centered, um, and it's part of MTSS and the Tier 1, so we're also walk, uh, working with Dr. Baines around that. So this is effective, um, I'm going to use Bobby's term, high leverage uh, instruction that needs to go on in the classrooms to get our students to these high reading levels. Um, one of the good things in uh, speaking with the person that we're working with with data is that 
our students this year in first grade are starting out four months ahead of where they were last year. So that's, that's good to see that. And as they uh, continue to grow up into third grade, um, the reading scores uh, will get better with that. Um, I also inquired about what is the difference, for example, in schools uh, where there is high, uh, high SES, um, children uh, that are on, you know, at proficient or above, it's about 65 to 70 percent of students that were not in this particular community, but in another community, 65 to 70 percent will be at grade level reading if the teacher is implementing small group differentiated instruction for the students. The difference with our instruction is we have um, two additional things. We have the assessment to instruction, which is an algorithm that provides information to teachers about how many minutes to spend on particular uh, skill sets that the children need. So that if uh, child number one is already reading at a first grade level, we want them to continue their growth. So I'm going to give this student something different than I would give another student that is still not at grade level. And so it's differentiated. It's going to help those that are struggling. It's also going to continue to grow those um, that are higher. And, oh, and with the A2I and having the coach and this particular program, it increases from 65 to 70 percent to 94 percent, as high as 94 percent of students reading at grade level, regardless of SES, which is huge for our school community. So, and you do in the in the glossary, you have SES. <laughs> uh, socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged, and the, the terminology changes over the years. Yeah. Know, any students coming from high poverty. Right. Simple language. Okay. Coming from high poverty, but regardless of the background um, with this particular uh, implementation of teaching kids to read, regardless of their poverty level or their background, um, they have success as high as 94%, which is, which is good news and important for, for our school community. Okay. So CEO and staff presenting our first success criteria on accelerating student learning, that would be 100% of our students who have entered our school since kindergarten will be reading at grade level by second grade. We'd like to hear from the board, is this a measure? Where do we need to go next if this is our measure given the data that Susan provided and where we want to be ultimately at 100%? Okay, so I just some clarification. At grade level by second grade, are you talking about the end of second grade in prep for third? Yes. Okay, thanks. What is the, is there a standard out there that or something that's typical across, say, LAUSD? Susan, would you like to address that? I'm sorry, can you put the question? I, I, you know, truthfully, I don't know if that's a great thing or if our kids that achieve that are still behind general population. If the students that achieve... If by, by the end of second grade are, are reading at second grade level, is that a good thing or... Yes, absolutely. Well, um, <laughs> it, it sounds like that, but what's, what are the statistics for students at large? Can I put it a little differently? Okay. Yes. Maybe, can I translate Leonard, I think? Please. Right. <laughs> so, um, the goal sounds great. I think I think what Leonard's trying to figure out and what I'm, I'd like to know as well is, is that uh, an aggressive goal, yeah. or medium medium goal, or or a, or a conservative goal? Aggressive. Okay. Extremely aggressive. That, that was a question, yeah. right? Yeah, 100%. I, listen, I, so, so, hey, Larry, look, I, I, assume, listen, I assume it's an aggressive goal. I just think our goal should be aggressive okay. if we want to be delivering the highest quality education to all our students. So. I think we just want to confirm that as a board that we are staying aggressive in our goals. That's setting. why the little guy on our logo is going like this. <gasps> right. He's exactly. aiming high. I think We're staying accelerated. Exactly. Yeah. Like 100% is really important accelerated. because why would, we, why would we ever set a standard that would assume not all of our children would well, I, sure. I think that's right. So I think we have to have 100%. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Where does that standard come from? 100% or? No, the uh, second grade, second grade level. It's going back yeah. that if children generally 
uh, people use third grade. You, they use children third grade. Children cannot read by third grade. Um, there's so many. There's so much different information about students. You know about uh, prison populations. Fifty percent of students that are uh, incarcerated are non-readers. Um, they struggle with reading. So this is this is a huge um, skill that students need to have in order to be successful Just, generally. But who sets the standard for grade level two? What's where is it? Well, that? part of it is you're it's learning back. to read. <laughs> You're kind of learning. No, I, I understand oh. that, but it sounds like there's some metric out there that would say. What, a, what assessment are you using? Right now, we're using the A2I assessment to instruction. And they um, and they have research that backs up that this is. Oh yes. Okay. Yes. Maybe at another meeting. So assessment to instruction is some published. It's through the University of Irvine. Okay. Um, and Dr. Connor is working with Learning Innovation. Um, along with this assessment, and she came up with, not her, but they came up with an algorithm to determine the minutes that children need in order to be successful. I know it came out of the state of uh, Florida where they did their Got research. It. So it is the only evidence-based research to uh, support learning. So there's some standard out there that, that you're comfortable <coughs> that is, is acceptable it's to apply. And then how do we know at the end of second grade are the kids given a test, or how do you know that they... Yes, this assessment is given throughout the school it's year. A, it, can be, it can be done every six, as often as every six weeks. So I'm, I'm looking at the HOI website. Yeah. I, would, I, would, I would summarize what I think happens is HOI was an assessment of, of literacy that just agreed upon general standards of what children should be able to know and know and be able to do and what assessment means when they enter third grade. And, and there's a lot of evidence that you they can read at third grade, they're going to be much more successful than if they can't. So, so the standard makes total sense. HY is one way to assess that. I didn't know about it before today, so I, I can't tell you I think it's the best thing in the world or not. Right. But it also then comes with a whole set of tools for the school yeah. to, to assess children, to help develop programs to make sure that children at different levels of getting the literacy get the help they need, and, and work with teachers, I assume, through your office. To, yeah. to, to, to make sure that the teachers know how, how, to, how to assess the challenges children have and help get them there. And, and whatever happens when you implement this, they won't, all be, you won't have 100% of literacy next year. It, it takes longer than that for teachers yeah. to learn how to do it, for right. students to get comfortable with it, yeah. um, and, and to be there. But, but the trick would be to, to see um, even larger numbers of, of students who are reading at grade level. I, I thought your numbers um, look reasonably high for a school in, in, in this area. Uh, so, so that they're starting from a good place, and, and, and it sort of seems like it fits in, as I read this very, very quickly, yeah. with the concepts around an accelerated school, yes. which yeah. I'm a little more familiar Absolutely. with. So, so it feels like, uh, I mean, you've obviously thought about it and picked the one that's going to work for you. I wouldn't yeah. ever think to second guess that, I promise. Uh, but this one looks like it makes sense to me. And please excuse my ignorance with it. I'm just looking at it, and it's a paragraph, and it looks great. But I wanted to no, drill, and I I want to drill down a little bit and know how it, how, where it came from, right. how it's applied, and how we know when we get there. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments from our board members on this first metric that all students in our schools at Accelerated should be reading at grade level by second grade? I just reach, have one, reach. One yes. question about it. Um, I, I like the measure a lot. What it, what does that mean for students that didn't start in kindergarten, and what percent of our kids oh, get point. through second grade and didn't start with us at kindergarten? That's a really good question, and it's actually, we have a very high retention rate at the lower grades. So, for example, Susan has almost 100% at ACES of our students matriculating to the other grade levels. Um, that, was some, that would be something to think about as we start drilling down to, cascading down this to all levels of the organization and different subgroups. But at first blush, we felt very comfortable to say that this is our promise to our kids in our community, that if you're starting with us at second for kindergarten, that you'll be reading at grade level by second. And what do we do with students that are significantly deficient in that goal by the time they're in second grade? Do we push them forward anyway, or do we... So there are parts of the program that are that we call intervention. So they, they would be given additional instruction and minutes so that they are meeting the goal. So first it's the goal. Where is the student towards the goal and how are we closing that gap? That gap that yes. analysis. Yes. Chair. And our special education students, are they going to be held to that same standard? That's another layer that we need to start thinking about, about the different subgroups and the different students. Okay. 
because I want to make certain that if students need accommodation or special circumstances, um, that that is absolutely addressed. So I know Dr. Baines is on that one. Okay. Thank you. The next level that we want to present is actually a success criteria that's called a growth measure. So the first one was an early literacy measure, and then the next one is a growth measure. And this one, even though you see that 100% of our students will grow one year in one year's time, this is actually probably the most aggressive goal that we're going to present to you in all of our four. Because what we know about organizations is go to the next one, that even though students grow, there are very few learning organizations where students do not grow, where they're receding in their learning. However, the question becomes, how much are they growing? And so the best learning organizations are able to achieve that blue line or that green line, and that blue line being one year's growth in one year's time. Now, a lot of organizations, learning organizations, they are growing their students, but they're growing at what you see is the dotted line, the lowest line, which is less than one year's growth at one year's time. So with the whole notion of what does accelerated mean, is this an aggressive goal? Mm -hmm. We want the best outcome for our kids. Our next success criteria that we would like to present to you is that all students in our organization are learning one year's growth in one year's time. And there's gonna be some metric that we introduce to that, which is minimum of 50 scale score points in ELA and math. Bobby, we're gonna introduce Bobby and ask him to come up. He's going to share some more details about why this should be the goal in our organization and linking the tie between one year's growth and one year's time to 50 scale score points. So to give you some context on this emphasis on growth, as opposed to the traditional metric of achievement, I want to give you a sense of where this fits into the big picture, not only in terms of what we're trying to achieve for our students, but also in terms of how we're being measured and assessed by outside organizations. So LAUSD is rolling out a new school performance framework this year that will be applied to all LA Unified schools and all charter schools that are overseen by LA Unified. It will look significantly different to the public than what the public is used to seeing when they look at our data over the past several years. You see here an example of a five-star system that simply rates all schools, both LAUSD and LAUSD overseen charters, as a one-star school, a two-star school, and so on up to five stars. It makes it very simple for the public to make a value judgment about whether or not this is a good school or whether or not one school is a better school than another one. The downside to this is that it removes all the complexity out of this and allows for the public to simply look at that five-star rating without considering all the factors that feed into that and knowing that different parents might be more interested in seeing our performance on certain metrics within that than that overarching goal. The bottom line though is that by this spring, every one of our schools along with every other public school in Los Angeles will have a five-star rating published on a public website. Now, I want to expose you, and this is just a beginning conversation around this. There are obviously much longer conversations to be had. But these are the metrics that will feed into that five-star rating that we will receive for each one of our schools. For elementary and middle schools, 45% of that rating will be based on growth. 35% will be based on achievement and 20% will be based on school climate. I'll pause for a minute to give you a second to take a look at all of the different metrics that are used to determine those factors and ask any questions that you might have about that. SBA is the smarter balance this, yes. assessment. Okay. I want to particularly emphasize 
the difference between growth and achievement. And that when we talk about achievement, we are holding all students to the same standard. We are simply saying, how high did you score on a particular test? And we are not considering the starting point of that student. Growth considers the starting point of that student. And so a growth metric actually gives us a much more accurate picture of how we as a school are performing in relation to other schools that may have very different populations in their system. So for example, a school where all students are entering already reading at or above grade level, where all students are entering with various types of privilege and advantage, their achievement scores might look higher, higher than ours, but they're not achieving growth. Knowing that we are intentionally serving students that often do not have the type of privilege that other systems might, might have built into the community, we want to emphasize on how we're helping them grow toward achievement. I'm clicking ahead now to the same information but for high school. You'll notice here the numbers are adjusted slightly to accommodate for the addition of the last column, college and career readiness. And I'll pause again here for you to process this information. Any questions on the high school metrics? Yes, Julie. Um, AP pass rate. Do we have enough AP classes in order for us to even be eligible in that particular category? We do. Okay. That is a complex, complex factor to consider in terms of the reputation of the school. Right. Because there are metrics out there that emphasize AP enrollment rate because there's quite a bit of research indicating that simply enrolling in an AP course provides long-term educational benefit to students. And so schools like ours have traditionally emphasized getting as many students as possible, even those who might not meet traditional prerequisites for entering an AP course into those courses to expose them to college level, really truly rigorous instruction, knowing that even if they don't pass that assessment at the end of the year, they're going to get long-term benefit. This metric though, focusing on pass rate, ultimately will discourage schools from enrolling students who may be less prepared for those classes in those courses. So again, there are many, many very long, very in-depth discussions to be had about these metrics and how we respond to them. But this is simply what we have and this is the information that's going to feed into this particular indicator. Okay, um, give us just a snippet on early assessment program and and why that's part of this particular metric. Sure. Um, and just to be perfectly clear on why these are part of these metric measures, this was adopted by the LAUS right. School Board, and so right. they've had those discussions on that. So all I can say is my understanding of their thinking around that. So that EAP is essentially a college preparedness test. It's there to determine the extent to which our graduates are prepared to go into on-grade level courses at universities. That's what I was looking for. Yes. Thanks. 